Okay, we go to come to the next speaker. And we are very happy to welcome Janet Thornton. Janet, if you can already come to the podium, please. So Janet is currently come in. Come on, Janet. <laughs> well, it's our stairs on the other side. I mean, you don't need to jump. Janet is at the European Bioinformatic Institute, and in fact, she will speak twice during this meeting. Once today for showing what she's doing now in terms of her scientific work she's carrying out, and one as a director of the EBI. So I won't speak at all, introduce her as the director of the EBI now, but basically on all of the work she has done around protein structure, and she has been, I would say, involved in all aspects of 3D structure prediction, analysis, and creation of database. In the long, I mean, career she had publishing so many different papers on those different aspects. Uh, as geolinks, I mean, you were not there yet, uh, Janet, everyone gets a simple introduction with where they were, where they worked, and with whom they have worked, you know. And of course, where, and for Janet, it's Nottingham, where you studied, I think, London, where most of your career took place, and Inkston. Now, the list of people which are associated through publication to the work is enormous. With for, for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. <laughs> And so is a, uh, this list would be huge because so many people, uh, Janet has worked with so many people, but you can see here Christina Orango, which is with us, Terry Atwood, which should have been here, and she just sent an email, I mean, apologizing again, but it's not her fault, it's Varek's fault, of course, saying she would have been happy to be here, Sir Shotia, David Jones, all of those people here, Michael Sternberg, uh, Shoshana Vodak, who is here also, and Tom Blondin, and of course, everyone at EBI, by definition. Uh, I know Janet didn't want me to show pictures or things like that. I still have one picture. Sorry, Janet. I mean, Janet was here at the 10 year anniversary meeting of SysPro 25 year of PDB. And, uh, I know that Joel Sisman is going to speak about that, but I wanted to show a picture showing, uh, Janet welcoming Olga Kennard, who was the head of, uh, the Cambridge Crystallographic Database. And you also see Alan Berman and Shoshana in this picture. And a picture I won't show because Janet is worried is the one where Janet and all of us other people in this meeting were dancing. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> not seen that picture. <laughs> you haven't seen that picture. <laughs> I don't want to see it. It's a nice picture. <laughs> so I want to say that also Janet enjoys life also, and uh, <laughs> it's a pleasure to be with her. So thank you, Janet, for being here. I'll try. Um, so I hope you can hear me. No, I've got. I'm. I'm wired up. Um, can Can you hear me at the back? Yes. It's okay, is it? So it, it's a great pleasure for me to be here uh, for the 20 year celebration of Swiss Prot. Um, obviously. My interest for many years has been in proteins and, and, and the Swiss Prot effort in gathering together the information, both in AMOS's at the S SIB and at the EBI, is, is a huge, huge effort that we've all benefited from. And it's really an honor and a privilege for me to be here for this 20th uh, anniversary. Um, but today, I'm going to talk, actually that's mine, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's all right, I don't need this, <laughs> sorry. Um, I, I'm going to talk about um, a new thing that we've been doing in my research group, and it's quite different from Swiss model and from the other things, because it's really almost the birth of a new effort, rather than describing something that's been going on for the last 10 or 20 years. And it's to do with looking at enzyme reaction mechanisms. And it's very much based on structure. And I'll tell you how far we've got with it. But it really is just, I think, the beginning. And it's something that's done uh, just in my, my research group. Um, as you know, enzymes are really very, very important uh, parts of, of, of the genome. We can see, if we look in the, in the uh, Uniprot database, that we, we've got almost 40% of the proteins in there 
are annotated with EC numbers, which means that they're enzymes. And in, in the PDB, for the structural data, we have even more, a larger fraction of enzymes. Almost 45% of the structures that we know correspond to enzymes. And if we look at the pathway database, obviously many of the pathways, both the metabolic and the signaling pathways, involve enzymes. We also know that as, as organisms evolve, they increase their numbers of enzymes. As they get more complex, as we get larger proteomes, we end up with more enzymes. And in fact, if you look at the bacterial enzymes at the bottom of this, uh, hang on, if we look here, these are the bacteria, so we're plotting the number of enzymes against the size of the proteome. There's a remarkable correlation, the correlation coefficient's about 0.98, between the number of enzymes and the size of the proteome. So as these bacterial genomes get larger, the number of enzymes in them correspondingly increase. When we look at, and when this is Shiri Freelich's work, when we look at the higher organisms, they have a smaller fraction of enzymes because the number of um, signalers and cell-cell communication, etc., has increased. So the fraction there has, has decreased. But clearly, as we evolve new organisms and more complexities, then similarly the enzyme complement of an organism changes. And in fact, you can plot also not just how many enzymes, but also the number of different reactions that they perform. So how many different sorts of reactions are there in different organisms? And as you increase the number of enzymes, do you get new reactions or the old reactions? And so you can do that by counting EC numbers at one level. That's an approximation. And you can see here that as the number of enzymes grows, the number of reactions that they can, that they can, um, catalyze also increases, so we get more and varied enzymes here. And you can see that some sorts of enzymes, like the transferases, have increased, have, has, have the hydrolases, whereas others, like the lyases in the uh, higher organisms, there aren't so many increase in those sorts of enzymes. In addition, of course, as organisms get more complicated, their pathways get more complicated. And we can see here the, the pathways for the sterile pathways. And the yellow blocks, this is obviously from the KEG database, you can see that some parts of these pathways are universal and they're more or less in all organisms. Others are just in metazoa, metazoans in the blue, and others still have only evolved in humans. And so, as organisms again involve, we get more and more different sorts of more complex enzymes, more complex pathways that go with them. So, we have a lot of information about enzymes, but despite that, there's still an awful lot that we don't know. So, we don't really understand the principles of catalysis, and the EC numbers, although they're brilliant in terms of defining the function, aren't perfect because they relate to the substrate and the product, not to the mechanism that's involved in going from one to the other. Enzymes and their evolution is a very interesting area that I've looked at with Christina Rengo and many other people, um, but it, it's still a lot to be answered. How do enzymes evolve? How do they change their, their substrates? How do they change their mechanisms? Can we, if we have a protein structure, predict what the enzyme function is going to be? This is an important question given hypothetical functions for many of the structural genomics targets. And also, of course, how do bacteria evolve to have different phenotypes by changing their metabolic pathways, their, the enzymes that they have? So there, there are many, many questions open about enzymes. And so many years ago, we decided that we would begin to look in more detail at enzymes, mainly because there were so many in the PDB, I guess. And so we, we felt that the first thing we needed to do was to get information about the active sites, where they were in these enzymes. And that led us to ask, what, what we wanted to do was to identify which are the catalytic residues, which are the residues involved in catalysis. 
And so we needed uh, to define what we meant by catalytic residue. And this is somewhat arbitrary. The, it's, it's difficult to define absolutely, but we needed at least to be consistent over the way that we looked at all the enzymes. So we require that a catalytic residue should be directly involved in the reaction mechanism, in that it will polarize or alter the pK of a residue or a water molecule that's involved in the reaction, or it could polarize or activate part of the substrate so that it would make a bond more susceptible to cleavage, or it might stabilize a transition state intermediate. So this was, these were the sorts of residues that we would include in our definition of catalytic residues. And from this, we developed what has become the catalytic site atlas. And really, this is very simple. It just gives a protein name. And fundamentally, what was important in here was the, the list of active site residues, the catalytic residues. Here you can see for beta-lactamase, serine 70, lysine 73, serine 130, and glutamic acid 16. And we only, we did this, and we've been doing this now for about the last six or seven years, by having summer students go through the literature, because the only place to find this information is in the literature. You can't, it's not contained within the PDB or within many of the other resources. And so we painstakingly, painful is the word, these summer students going through, looking usually at four or five different papers, and we only define these residues when we have a good feeling for what the catalytic mechanism is, a, a, a reasonably experimentally validated catalytic mechanism. When we did this the first time, we had 200 enzymes. Um, and one of the first questions we said was, well, is this information available in the PDB or in SwissProt? And what you can see here is that much of this information was not available at that stage. This was 2004. And you can see that, in fact, in the CSA, we have additional, compared with SwissProt, whoops, here, we have extra residues. SwissProt have a few others that are in the binding site that we would not consider to be catalytic in the same sense, although obviously involved in binding. Within the PDB, within the structural data, in fact, there was rather poor overlap. Um, and many, often these, the active site residues, will include binding sites, residues, not really those involved directly in catalysis. So we feel that this does bring new information that, that's important for us. And over the, follow, the last five years, we've looked at different things, making templates, looking at conformational change, etc. But I'm not going to talk about that today, because um, well, let me um, let me say where we are today with the catalytic site atlas. At the moment, we've got about 700 um, entries. Those are broadly non-homologous entries, so they're not uh, identical. They're, they're approximately that. With these, you can annotate about 15,000 structures within the Uniprot system. And obviously, we've done some using these to annotate genomes um, and using the, the Uniprot resource to really check. Basically, when you find a homologue, if it changes its catalytic residues, then it's quite likely to have changed its function as well. And so we showed that by checking those individual residues, you could improve your prediction of what the function of the enzyme was going to be. So this is quite important. So, so far, so good. But in order to put together the catalytic site atlas, we had to, we being the, the royal we, of course, the students and, and Gail Bartlett in particular at the beginning, had to go through and really understand the mechanism of the enzyme as it was presented so that she could take out which were the residues involved in catalysis. But within the CSA, there was no way to store these mechanisms. And in fact, Gail had uh, cards that she'd written down these mechanisms on. And this seemed crazy to me. I thought, this is not... We, when Gail leaves, as all students do, 
we're going to lose all this information. So we started to think about trying to capture that information, how we could capture it for a mechanism within a database. And that's what I'm going to tell you about today. And the outcome of that is the Macy database. This is a, a very nice collaboration between the EBI uh, in my group here and also the Unilever Chemoinformatics Centre in Cambridge, in the chemistry department in Cambridge, and uh, where uh, John Mitchell is the lead person. And it's also a collaboration with Peter Murray Rust, who many of you will know from the chemoinformatics small molecule world. And Gemma and Daniel are currently working on the current version of Macy and trying to uh, look at that. And I should say this is very much a research project. It isn't part of the EBI's sort of standard databases that are funded centrally. This is just uh, research to see whether we could do it and whether um, what, what we can learn by, by looking at it. So MACI stands for Mechanism, Annotation, and Classification in Enzymes. So why did we develop it? To gather the information on the mechanisms, to compare and to contrast mechanisms in different proteins, to help to validate enzyme mechanisms, because once you start looking at these mechanisms, you realize that they're actually very difficult to define, and they're also difficult to validate experimentally. And so we felt if we could compare them easily in the computer, then that would give us a way that we could more easily validate enzyme mechanisms. We wanted to study their evolution, we also ultimately, and this is more John's interest, to develop a mechanism-based classification of enzymes rather than the EC number. Ultimately, of course, we'd like to predict mechanism from structure. This is a big, big challenge, but it would be an interesting one to try and do. And of course, mm -hmm. if we can understand more about these mechanisms, we might be able to design new enzymes with new catalytic properties. So. This is the database. It's still, I would say, evolving. Um, it's recently gone into a MySQL version so that you can search it. And Gemma Holiday at the EBI has been doing that. And you can go and look at it. And I checked it just before I came up to see whether it was working or not. So it does seem to be working today. Um, so what, what exactly have we got in Macy? So I'll briefly describe that and then say something. So obviously, uh, at the moment, there are 199 EC numbers within. They're mainly non-homologous. So again, so there are mechanisms for about 199 different enzymes in there. We've obviously got the EC number and any obsolete things. We've got the reference structure because you can only do these mechanisms when you really have a good structure with a substrate bound where you have any chance at all of predicting what the mechanism is. Obviously, we, we link to the domain classification in CAF, the Uniproc code, the species from which the, the structure, the 1B57 in this case, was taken, uh, the cofactors, catalytic residues, and links to other databases. So I'll use this enzyme, fructose bisphosphate aldolase, as an example to show you what we've tried to do. We classify the residues according to the catalytic function that they perform, and this is a list of the ones that we've got. This is still evolving because some of these overlap and it's not clear that we should necessarily use these as our final set, but this was our sort of starting point. So let me tell you what we've got. So overall, we've got the, the overall reaction. In this case, for this enzyme, glycerone phosphate plus D-glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate gives us D-fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So basically, this enzyme is a ligase, it joins together these two molecules to create the, the fructose bisphosphate. So how do we store the mechanism? So this is how the enzyme starts on the left. This is the step one. And for each step, we have the reactants, and that involves the, the small molecule in the middle, if I can, this bit here in the middle, the small molecule, plus the catalytic residues from the enzyme, the glue, the asp, and the azon, that are bound. So those are the, if you like, the molecular entities involved. Also, we've got a sodium and a zinc. Now the mechanism, oops, for the, the no, hang on. The mechanism then for the step one, this is a proton transfer 
It's a ketoenol tautomerization, a system. So what we store is which bonds are formed, which bonds are cleaved, the change in bond or whether, whether it's going from a single to a double bond, how many of them there are, etc. So this defines this change from step one to step two. And you have to store the molecular, the connectivity tables for all of these. Then the cofactors, the, the sodium and the, uh, the zinc, and then the residues that are involved but on a spectator basis, i.e. they don't change their chemistry, they just look. So in this case, in this first step of the mechanism, we've got uh, this asparagine is a spectator side chain, it's an acceptor and a donor, and it's a transition state stabilizer. We've also got the aspartic acid here is a spectator side chain, and it's a hydrogen bond acceptor. The residues that actually react in this case, it's this, in this first step, is this glutamic acid that whips uh, a hydrogen from the substrate onto the glue so that it becomes protonated here in this first step. So you can see this is incredibly detailed, complex information. You have to do that for the second step. In this case, this second step is the rate determining step, so that is, is noted. And also for the third step. We also try to always make sure that the enzyme ends up in the state that it started, so it goes in a cycle really as you're going round. And often when you're taking a whole reaction, there are reactions that occur separate from the enzyme and those have to be included. So that in this case, for this enzyme, you end up with the complete reaction mechanism here and then you've got this outside the enzyme, if you like. So that is all stored within the database. So this is what it looks like. So what can you actually do with it? As I say, it's now in, uh, it, it was all done in, with XML and CML, and uh, Gemma and Peter Murray Rust worked very hard on, on getting it into a form that that, but then the transfer obviously from, from XML into the MySQL database was fairly straightforward. So what can you query for? And I'll just give it one or two examples. Um, you can query by reaction comments, you can query by the enzyme, you can query by the chemical changes, or you can query by the KEG or the KEBI compound ID or compound name. At the moment, you can't query using chemistry tools, uh, but that's hopefully, that's a big, actually, that's another big step that we've got to take. But we're hoping to be able to do that going forward. So, for example, one of the things I've wanted to know for ages is, well, how many different ways has nature evolved to cleave a carbon-carbon bond? So you can do that. You can go in and you can... Uh, just ask how many different sorts of carbon-carbon cleavage occur, or how many different ways are there of, um, of adding a sulfur onto a substrate, or something like that. So you can make these sorts of queries, and we really are just in the position where we're beginning to start to analyze the data. We've not done a lot of the analysis yet. Um, but one of the very simple things one can do is to look at the frequency of the amino acids along the top, and the What does that mean? Five minutes. Okay. And, and the, the function, you remember the, the, the functions down the side, and you can draw heat maps of which amino acids have strong preferences for acid-base function, which ones have no strong preference, and which ones, these here, the, the met val glen, uh, you can see at the bottom here, uh, these have no reactions at all, as you would, you would obviously expect. So that's really what uh, about the database. I, I just thought I'd finish by describing some work that Gail Bartlett did actually before we had the database. But I think that it's interesting to illustrate the sorts of questions we can ask. And this was to say, if we looked at homologous enzymes, that had a different EC number, that had changed their, their reaction, then how similar were these mechanisms? So how do enzymes modify the chemical reaction they catalyze if they use the same structural cat, uh, scaffold, i.e. a homolog? And do catalytic residues conserve their role, 
or identity and enzyme catalyst reactions. So this was Gail's work. She started out with a data set of only 178 enzymes. She found these 27 pairs of homologous proteins with a totally different function at the primary EC level. So that you're, there, are, there are six different sorts of enzyme EC1, 2, 2, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, that define completely different functions. So we looked in detail at those 27 residues and we looked at the mechanisms that they performed. So we had 27 pairs of proteins, three of those were enzyme-non-enzyme pairs, and 24 were enzyme-enzyme pairs from 21 different enzyme superfamilies. This shows the change of EC class, and you can see that we in particular had, so we had three examples of an EC1, an oxidoreductase, changing to um, a hydrolase. We had seven, which was by far the largest, of liases changing into isomerases. For good reason, I think, because they, they, you can see that that might, might make sense. So all but one of the enzyme pairs have their active site in the same place. Substrates and our products are shared by 11 pairs, and the cofactor is shared by five of the enzyme pairs. The metal binding site Sometimes the metal site is conserved, sometimes it's altered, sometimes it changes the ion that is bound. So this just shows one example where in uh, the rubridoxin oxygen oxidoreductases, we've got a diion site that has the ligands on the left, and you can see we've got his glue, asp, his, asp, his, compared with the metallo beta lactamase on the right, the same function, but now that's binding two zincs, and we've seen the glue change to a his and the asp change to a cis. We can look at the catalytic pairs. Sometimes they have an identical role when they conserve the residues. Sometimes they have a different role in catalysis, and sometimes we have different residues being brought in from the binding site to do a different job. So you can change the residue identity and the residue function. And this just shows one, one example where we have an endonuclease and xylosisomerase in the same family. And here we've got a his changing to a trip, and the endonuclease changes to the xylosisomerase. So we've, we've got a change here. I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go very quick. So broadly... When we look at this, we find that of these 27 pairs, seven of them shared a step at the beginning and then diverted. Seven of them started off differently, had the same mechanism in the middle, and then changed at the end. Two of them started the same, went different in the middle, came back to the same. And eight of them had completely and utterly different mechanisms that had evolved presumably independently. Um, I've not got time for that. So the conclusions there then are that the enzymes really are quite nifty. I don't think this doesn't happen very often. I think it's, it's actually quite rare. In the vast majority of cases, the mechanisms within families, very, very large families, are absolutely conserved. These are the exceptions rather than the rule. But they're very economical in the way that they use their active site residues and the features. Um, if the residues conserve their identity, then they tend to conserve the function that they perform within the, within the mechanism. If they change, then they tend not to perform the same function. They change the function that they do. And what we, as you saw from the numbers, it, it's the, the um, common steps are, tend to be at the beginning. Very, the most common thing is for them to be the same at the beginning and then diverge at the end. And that might be because those are the most difficult steps or that the intermediate is the least stable and therefore the most difficult to stabilize. So future, we're, as I say, Gemma and Daniel are currently increasing the coverage in Macy and we should be, the, ne the next real release will have 200, which surprisingly covers about 70% of EC space. It's quite interesting, actually. I, I've not got the figures for that, but, it, but it's interesting. We're analyzing them in, in, in Cambridge. 
they've already analyzed them from an Ingold reaction perspective and looking at the environments. Obviously, we want to look at the evolution in more detail and then go on to design. So, I really want to acknowledge the people who've been involved in, in this um, quite difficult project in some ways. Gail Bartlett at the beginning, uh, who, who did a lot with Craig Porter and Jonathan Barker to set up the Catalytic Site Atlas. Um, James Torrance, Alex and Gemma, who've been working, Gemma in particular, on the Macy database, Alex Moore on the Catalytic Site Atlas, and James on the 3D templates. The Macy team at, the, at Cambridge University, John, Daniel, and Peter, and it's really extremely good to have real chemists involved, not, not a physicist like me. I mean, it's absolutely essential. And of course, our funders. And thank you for listening. Do we have any questions? Hi, Janet. Um, do you get a sense of how accurate the literature-based reaction mechanisms are? Did you find problems and inconsistencies with them? There, there are certainly problems. And one of the things that, as we've gone farther on, the, the provenance, the experimental validation of the data, I think, are becoming increasingly important. And so we're trying to uh, store that as well as just the, the mechanisms, what it's validated. But one of the reasons for doing this is really, I, I said a little bit about the validation, but my feeling is that just as with proteins, when you compare multiple things, you, you can, you know, obviously with ProCheck and things like that that we did in my lab, it gives you a good way to say whether a structure is a good one or a bad one. What we hope is that if we can gather the data together, we can find a way to at least validate in principle some of the mechanisms and see whether they look reasonable or not in, in a way. There are multiple mechanisms, and one of the things that we've not done at the moment is put in alternative mechanisms. We take the one that looks to be the one that's best supported by the experimental data. But obviously, going forward, it would be very good if we could store alternatives. And also, if people solve a new structure, they could suggest a mechanism and ask whether it looks like any of the other mechanisms that are in the database. Cedric? Uh, do, do you think there is such thing as, as uh, 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 an evolutionary tra trace on the, on the metabolite side? Uh, just like one may find on the protein side, looking for conserved feature, evolutionary conserved feature at, at the metabolite side. Are we looking at the chemical descriptors and things like that? Or are you looking into um, this thing? I'm, sh I'm sure there is. I mean, it's, it's just the, 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 as we know, the, the, um, the catalytic residues of all residues are the best conserved of everything. You know, much better than binding sites or, or anything. And so I think um, the problem is that I think at the moment we really don't probably have enough data to really... Um, is that what you're meaning? Or, or are you meaning from a sequence perspective? No, 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 from, from a, a small molecule from a perspective. Small, small yeah. set. I'm sure that the phylogen... I mean, looking at the real evolution, I showed... I didn't really show evolution. I showed comparison of two structures. I didn't look at how they had evolved that, that differences. And I think that, that is very likely, that, that one should be able to look at that. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, here. Joel. Janet? Yeah. I'm curious, in the CSA, yeah. how often have you found a second um, obvious catalytic site that the experimentalists didn't see in some sense that the protein might be um, doing more than one thing at a different site? Or hasn't that been the case? <laughs> so... I didn't talk about any of this side of it at all. Um, I think the answer is not very often, but I also think that you, um, th this really comes down to the question of how often 
a catalytic mechanism has recurred multiple times during evolution. That, that's really the basis of the question. So how often, if you get a catalytic triad, which as you, you know, recurs in another thing. So catalytic triads, the catalytic triad, is unique in that it recur has recurred so many times. There are not so many really good examples, but there's nothing to compare with the catalytic triad. There are a few, like the, the ASPs in the, the aspartic proteinases, that recur. Um, but I could show you some slides about that, but, but, but it's, it's a, a, a very interesting question. I'm afraid we have no more time for questions. Let's thank Dr. Martin again.